Well, I have a wonderful electronic invention I want you to see. It, it looks something like this. Welcome to the CTO Studio. I'm your host, Etienne de Bruin. The CTO Studio is where we chat with CTOs building amazing products with incredible teams. Have you chatted with a CTO lately? Kelly Abbott, welcome to the CTO Studio. Thank you. I it's 1 p.m. on Friday. Mm. We're having uh, some beers. Mm. Ball Brewing. They're the uh, they're the punk rockers of the beer scene down here. Do you know them? No, I've just been to their their um, you know tasting room down in North Park. They have a lot of cool art. Their t-shirts are all like basically knockoffs of like famous band posters and things like that. Um, I don't even know anything about them or their roots or anything like that, but I think they're still independent. They haven't been bought up by anybody big yet. Yes. Yeah. Um. <laughs> I can tell you're fascinated by this. <laughs> slow start on this one? No, not Perhaps a slow, we need more no, it's not a slow it. start because I was wanting to say to you that I'm violently attracted to you, oh. but I was wondering if that would be a, if that would be appropriate. No, not appropriate. Not appropriate. But acceptable in my Except, world. Yes. Yeah. Cuz inappropriate is basically where we should start. Yes, I think that's where we should start. Uh -huh. So, I remember meeting you downtown San Diego about <laughs> 7 8 years ago. Yeah. And I, it was right around my sort of awakening time where I lift my head from, lifted my head from my desk and thought, okay, I should engage the startup scene. I was building Monk at the time. And I was, I was, I was a little frightened of the San Diego tech scene. Yeah. And we went to a restaurant downtown and I remember I didn't really have anybody to talk to and I'm a, I am a raging extrovert, but I felt pretty, pretty lonely. And you just came up to me and you, you asked me who I worked for, what I did. And then your second sentence was, well, we should work together. And I think at that time it was a product, Dandelion or something? Dandelion, yeah. What, Dandelion, what was that? Yeah. <laughs> It was uh, the elevator pitch is a short. It was a uh, social biography network, so social network where you write your life story, and as you're writing your story, you, you invariably involve other people in your stories. Like if I could write about today, I would tag you in it, and that would appear as a leaf in your book too. Oh man! So your whole life story could be there archived, maybe even written entirely for you. So in, you're right. So in other words, if the, the fact that you would mention me mm -hmm. would somehow incorporate that paragraph into yeah. my story. Yeah. What happened to that? Uh, well, there was no money behind it. You know, I raised $20,000 and then was just doing it in my like spare time consulting and stuff. And I actually got a pretty good size of a network i think there were at the time i quit twenty five thousand users in the in the system but you know i couldn't figure out if i could monetize it i couldn't figure out if it was anything beyond a novelty or a feature one of the best conversations i had around it was someone who's a vc who shall remain nameless um had had been familiar with it had looked at it and one of our, our one of our crowning achievements was this word cloud timeline hybrid thing that we had built so you could see you could see your life in a, at a glance and see these big moments with titles on them at a glance um it was a pretty cool feature people loved it and the guy just was like hey that's a great feature but why is this a destination and i was mm. just mm. torn by that he just stuck the dagger in my heart twisted it and he was not right but he also gave me you know a huge lesson which is i wasn't doing much besides making it a set of features i didn't make it a destination i didn't make it a place for people to hang out i didn't have like this incredible vibe that should have been happening there but uh to be fair this is what this is seven eight years ago yeah i mean the social scene was still forming 
the social yeah. networking scene. I mean, Facebook yeah. had already, I think, set its course, right? But but there were still opportunities to have it become some sort of social network. Yeah. I forget what I was thinking in terms of how you would be involved with it. Maybe Monk Maybe would. you were just trying to pawn it off to Monk or something. <laughs> trying to find a seller. I was probably buyer. pretty, pretty, yeah, pretty desperate by that point. You did, uh, I mean, you did. Sounds did, like a desperate move. You too. did command the conversation. Yeah. Walk I mean, up you, you to can, a guy you don't know, and then we should work two together. seconds later, we should work together. Well, what I really remember about that night was, it was a pretty, in my opinion, a pretty high-profile group of people, and we were at this restaurant, and everybody, you know, when they take the orders <laughs> around the table, uh, everybody was ordering sort of the $25, $30 entrees, I think, sort of some social pressure. And then when they got to you, you ordered the hot dog. Mm-hmm. And I was like, this is, I love this guy. Mm-hmm. An $8 hot dog. And I was like, I wish I had ordered after he ordered. <laughs> <laughs> Did I change my order to the $8 I'll hot have dog? have what he's having. <laughs> um, you do have that air about you, man. That sort of self-confident, I know what I want, I know what I need to do vibe. And to yet, this, to I, this don't. Day. I don't know what I want, but just, and I it's don't the know vibe. what I need to do. It's the vibe, though. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Um, I think yeah. that's why I think people need, need authenticity, and they, they need those people who just portray that, that vibe. Mm. I think they need that. Mm. So after Dander Life, you formed, is it that when you formed Three Ones? That uh, is, yes. It's just a little product development consultancy. <clears throat> what I do remember is we, that was around about the time that I started getting involved with the SD Ruby group. Mm. And that's where we did decide to do a small project together, which ended up becoming one of the defining moments in my life. Do you remember that, that demo that we did? <sighs> do I remember? Do you it? remember who was in the room? I do. <laughs> <laughs> Our current mayor was uh, the guest of honor for this little little uh, get-together that we were demoing this product. And uh, one of those, I hear all the details? One of those moments. <laughs> so I, uh, I had just started uh, exploring new languages. I was mostly in the LAMP stack and uh, told Kelly that I could build this retweet monetization tracking influencer type tool and um, I think we did pretty damn good for a four-week effort. Mm. Um, but um, I remember feeling like I was being led to the slaughter when I drove to that demo because the app just the app wasn't working. Mm. And um, ultimately, we did get it to work by some miracle. We were able to demonstrate some retweets, but that was tense, man. Yeah. And yet, you 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 handled the demo and. We're still friends. Yeah. I mean, even Bill Gates got a blue screen of death at some point in his life, right? Probably right in the middle of a large developer convention. And I mean, I still think that my giving tweet <clears throat> could have gone places. Yeah. I think most ideas can go places, right? They don't exist in a vacuum and they're not just, I mean, it's very uncommon to just have like a completely weird clueless idea i mean totally detached from reality um because most of us are not crazy and detached from reality we have a niche that we want to scratch we scratch it and you know we're only human so most a lot of other people will have those just a matter of like you know making it sustainable and are you willing to to do everything it takes to to make it work yeah so why didn't we take my giving tweet any further what happened that was a long time ago. Yeah, I don't know. So then, uh, so then you got into the commenting space, right? You you yeah. built you built um, what was it called? Real tidbits. Real tidbits. Yeah. And that was at the sort of the sort of this wave that was forming around commenting on articles and then doing something with those analytics, right? Mm-hmm. And you built the company, sold the company. Mm-hmm. And then after that, decided you were going to build the Netflix of short stories. Yes. Tell me about that. 
Which one? Real Tidbits or Great Jones Street? Um, no, tell me about Great Jones Street. Okay. Well, Great Jones Street is a labor of love. I come from a family of writers. Um, my dad is a accomplished short fiction writer and has taught fiction writing in the, at university for, well, now he's retired, but all my life growing up, he was in this world and we were surrounded by artists and my mom owned a children's bookstore and we just had books at the center of our lives. And I was this kind of black sheep. I could get things that were technical. I kept pestering them for a computer and they had no need of, for anything outside of a typewriter. And, you know, I wanted to tinker with things, but we're just in a house where you, you just read things, you know, you read things, you watch things, you talked about things, a house of ideas. Um, so ironically, I didn't get much technical stuff at home. I got it all in school. Um, but that's not where, why we're, what we're talking about. We're talking about Great Jones Street, which basically after I had the exit, I had a little, you know, had some choices on what I could do next. And I thought, um, you know, my little addiction to reading fiction on my phone would be best served by reading short fiction because I was reading a lot of eBooks and only fiction. And reading a novel on a phone is takes takes hard work you know i was doing that because i was traveling a lot and it was just easier than carrying books with you and um and i didn't like the kindle you know i just thought that was an extra piece of hardware that i could i didn't need to put in my bag if i could read something on my phone i would um and you know my dad being my dad who writes short fiction i just thought well there's got to be there's got to be a resource for buying stories and and putting those on my phone and there just wasn't um, so then I thought, well, there's probably a Netflix style model here. If I can acquire a bunch of content, a bunch of really good stories and offer them to a user base that was willing to pay a nominal monthly fee, three ninety nine, four ninety nine, nine ninety nine, whatever it might be, I could acquire enough subscribers to make this a pretty easily sustainable business model. And we went out and bought a lot of really good stories. I mean, we're talking Pulitzer winners and all the category winners for all the genres. And we did this really cool album art for it. And we did, we had the writers themselves record readings of them and we uploaded those into the app. We created a pretty cool experience, I thought, but we just couldn't get people to download the app. You know, I don't know if it was app fatigue or the fact that people's, you know, reading needs were really just being met by Amazon and they couldn't care less about something new. And short fiction, you know, we did all the market research on it. We knew it was pretty tiny fraction of the total total spend, but it would be enough if we even if we made like a half a percent dent in that market, we'd be millionaires. Like it would be amazing. But even with that tiny little niche market, we couldn't really get traction. Um so yeah, we spent a lot of money and then I'm in the process of spinning it down. And but you can still download the app and still no. enjoy the stories. No, uh, no, the app is gone. No, we put everything online though, so you can get it through the web. Um, but you know, no, none of those features that are in the app are available. Oh wow! So it's not even just out there to just kind of see what could happen with this. No, some... no, I I couldn't get that part. That part was actually probably the most frustrating. Is I did spend a lot of money on the product. And, um, you know, probably what three or four times as much on the product as I did on the content and the marketing of it. And I, if I had to do it over again, I would reverse that completely. I would and maybe even partner with a, another company that had a product like a gum road or even just go through Amazon and Apple themselves because the marketing piece was mm. so crucial to getting, getting you know, users and readers. So help me understand why can the app not just be in the app store? Uh, well, just the, the infrastructure that was required to host it all was just cost okay. prohibitive. So just to, you had to wind down, not only you had to wind down the infrastructure. Yeah. And then just a brief segue. Um, what does it take to purchase books? I mean, <laughs> less than you think. I mean, the most difficulty I had uh, well, so, okay. Well, you purchase the licensing, you yeah, license the book, right? Yeah, so the, here's the deal. In, in publishing, I didn't know this going into it. I had to figure it out. But in publishing, um, normal, the normal process for a short story to get published means that 
immediately after it's published, wherever it gets published first. The rights revert back to the author, him or herself. The author is free to sell that story to anybody else he or she wishes. And the precedent for that has just been like, well, if it's already been published in Harper's or Playboy or wherever, you know, the only other person who's going to buy this is somebody who wants it for their anthology or a publisher who wants to put together a collection of your own, you know, like 12, 13, 15 stories into a nice book size thing. Um, and that, that's it. That's how, that's how it, it, the publishing world has been operating for the last 120 or so years as far as short fiction was concerned. So I just capitalized on that paradigm and would just call up, I would see a story that was popular in a magazine or, you know, it could have been 10 years ago, 20 years ago, whatever. Go see that story, go call the writer or their agent or their publisher and say, I want to buy the rights for this story as a reprint in my app. And it was just mm -hmm. like, an overnight process. So that is not an exclusivity thing. It's just a re. That's basically a reprint that goes into your store. Yeah, and that's how we were able to get. We got by the end of the licensing process, which took us. I mean, we acquired a lot of content really quickly. Probably about three months, we acquired fifteen hundred stories, five hundred writers. And one of the innovations that we built was this licensing system that mm. would just automate that whole content acquisition and convert it to readable formats and you know all the workflow involved in making the artwork for it and yeah. the reviews and oh. all that stuff was part of the technical stuff that we do did. Do you think one can judge a book by its cover? <laughs> I yeah, yeah. I mean you try and you try and sex it up a little bit. We spent a lot of I know. effort. Your, your covers were amazing. Yeah. And I and I, I had a sense you put an effort into that because that's what you felt consumers did was they look at the cover and then decide if they want to read the book. Well, yeah. I mean, you look at beer labels too, and you're like, do these guys have pride in their work or not? And so you what can kind of tell that by... What you know. was more expensive, the acquiring of the reprint licensing or the generation of the album artwork, book artwork? Oh, we would... So if we spent 50 bucks on a story, which was co pretty common, mm -hmm. we might spend 150 on the marketing and packaging of it. Crazy. Yeah. What's happened with your relationship to all these authors? You know, when I, I saw, so I emailed, so this was, uh, what, right at the end of last year. And I just emailed my investors and a week or so after that, e emailed all the authors. And the response from everybody, investors and authors, has been like, look, we love what you did and fell in love with it for a reason and joined you on this journey for a reason. So... You know, you have a special place in our hearts for trying to fight this battle. <laughs> um, so yeah, those the relationships are good. I just you know wish I could have made it a longer battle. You know, definitely, definitely the first time that I've had firsthand witness to someone winding down a startup. Mm. I've, I've always, I've always seen startups just kind of fizzle. But you were definitely the first experience I had with someone announced the wind down. I mean, I've seen those emails, so-and-so is winding down mm -hmm. uh, from Silicon Valley or some kind of startup, um, few and far between. But for you, because we're friends, I sort of saw, your, saw the emotional agony, mm -hmm. the highs, the lows, and then winding it all down, man. Yeah. So right now, zero dollars and zero cents per month spend on Great Jones Street, or is it still? There's still some stuff up, but it's actually really inexpensive right now. Um, you know, like I'm looking at your podcasting rig here, and I'm thinking maybe I can resurrect some portion of it, right? Like my connections with writers, talk to them once a week, understand why stories work, what you know, why they write, all that stuff still fascinates me. So I don't think I'm gonna get very far from. You shouldn't. From it. You shouldn't. But, yeah. Did you ever consider combining the reading of the story with some independent artist's song or, and then kind of <laughs> having a... <laughs> we did this experiment <laughs> with MusoList, as a matter of fact. I, still, you know, I, I, I felt a... Um, so what we did was we had some of the authors read the books, their stories, and then we combined it with some songs that Kelly and I sort of co-produced. Mm-hmm. And I felt to myself build a relation. I still think about some of those stories today. It's still, yeah. it, I guess it's stored in a different part of my brain because there's music associated with it. Yeah. 
That was actually a really nice experiment. It's hard work, though. It is hard work. Packaging those up was took a lot of your time and my time. No. Yeah. The we, writers loved it. We though. do own musobooks.com. We do? We? <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> I love it. So anyways, um, mostly your roles have been uh, product, CEO, founder, um, project management. And so now um, I want to get into what you're doing now, which is tablecloth. Mm. And surprise, surprise, you are the CTO of Tablecloth. Yeah. So um, I want you to tell me everything about that. Um, do you consider yourself a, a non-technical CTO? Um, it's a broad would, phrase. Yeah, I would say that I'm not a coder CTO. Um, and I immediately jump into the role of being more of a managerial CTO. So hire competent people who are better at that task than I am under me and express what I need from them. You know, sort of point to the top of the mountain and say, we're going to hike this together. You know, what do I need to pack? Uh, you know, and that's when the magic happens. You give people a lot of leeway. You give them some creative responsibility and they'll impress you. So how are you? So, so there, there are two levels. One in your executive meet so 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 tell us what tablecloth does and then i'd like to know on an executive level how are you showing up as what what is the team getting from you as cto mm. uh on the executive level and the co-founder level and then what and then maybe we can dig into your team and how you're composing your team or how you plan on doing it sure. um so so let's do that all right so what's the first one what does tablecloth do tablecloth does Basically, we are in the nonprofit space, um, which means that we talk to nonprofits, their funders, and their corporate partners, and we help them determine what their impact in society is. A part and parcel with that is also reporting on that impact. And the way that we came to this business was that lots of foundations will you know, fund 10, 20, 100 different organizations in a particular impact area. So let's say we're trying to get uh, kids to read more books in San Diego, right? There might be 40 different organizations that are working in literacy with children. So a foundation like the San Diego Foundation, which has many millions of dollars in management that they can donate to this, will require as a part of that funding to get a report back. And oftentimes what happens there is they just get their, you know, nonprofit's annual report, and maybe some like, maybe some like an email or two about you know, specific uses of the dollars that, that they got from them. It's very messy. It's not very well organized. And at the end of the day, it doesn't really even point toward impact. Um, and so we just thought there was a better way and that if it was possible, we would figure out how to combine the many streams of data that each of these orgs would create in measuring their impact into a single dashboard that a foundation could, could use. So in this case, San Diego Foundation would be able to say, I wonder what the impact is of a nonprofit X in whatever we are funding them to do, and then they would see some sort of dashboard. Yeah, yeah, and you know, our original thesis on this was it's all about the data. Like, There's some play here where each of these orgs can, can log their data, and it can be all combined into one pool that then you know, they can share with each other, learn from each other's work. As we've evolved in our thinking, because we're doing a lot of customer development here where we're just, you know, trying to get people to tell us what their pain points are and we can design product around it. There really is a, just a, a need to provide better communication tools between the different entities. So um, if you look at the product today, we've got survey tools that look just like SurveyMonkey or type form we've got you know databases which nobody looks at if you want to look at it we'll pop it into a google sheet or something like that um and then the reporting dashboards it actually shows you know data visualizations right business intelligence layers on top of that data um but the way that it gets reported is almost like a facebook feed so if i'm a funder i see all the fundees in my stream and as they have stuff to post they might be posting charts, 
one day, but the next day they're posting a video showing what they did. Uh, you know, you might get periodic updates mm. from the CEO who's talking about their new volunteer program, which wouldn't have been possible mm. without those donor dollars. Stuff like that, that that team now is getting a steady stream of inputs and not just having to wait till the end of the year. What I love that. about that is, so you're appeasing the analytical, what's the ROI, mm. but also tugging at the heartstrings. Yes. It's the Kelly Abbott way, man. That's my way, for sure. So uh, it, am I as a nonprofit then coming to you and saying, well, we store our attendees or our volunteer participation in this kind of spreadsheet and then you just plug it into your, you, you Zapier that into your system or you, so you basically ingest whatever data they give you or mm -hmm. do you prescribe how they log their, their data? Well, we provide recipes for them. So a lot of them have similar needs in terms of the kinds of metrics that are important for them to measure. Um, so like, for example, if we're talking about volunteers as being a KPI for an organization, um, they, you know, there's a volunteer check-in recipe that they can just use. And it'll, okay, have, okay. it'll just sort of be pretty ready-made for them. So I'm talking about a highly non-technical user Yes, user-based. yes, yes. So a nonprofit could say, actually, we don't know who shows up at our events because one time we use Eventbrite, another time we use yeah. Meetup. And then you actually, as a value add, say, well, here's a recipe for how you can now capture that data. Yeah. So as, um, as CTO, are you then, so are you the technical voice in, in the room then? Yeah. Um, so there's visioning and we want this and then you come with, my gut says this can be done or... And then you add some dollars and cents to that, or yeah, I mean, I think what we're we're kind of where the approach that we're taking now is that we know that there's a thing to productize and automate and turn into a velocity subscription model type business, right? And um, and that's somewhere off in the future. But right now, what we're doing is we're learning as much as possible from real examples, from real orgs and real foundations and real companies who want to work together to solve a problem. And so. Um, so a lot of what we build right now are just those first recipes. And so as we're building these objects, later on those things can be automated, later on those things can be put into a catalog, Maybe later on they can be pieced together in ways that are more meaningful. But right now we're just learning from how they're using these products, how they're using these, these forms, um, and you know what kind of value they put on data and what kind of value they put on storytelling. Um, so, you know, the projects that we're involved in have a sponsor, a big sponsor who's got all these funding dollars and they want to solve a big problem and there's a bunch of different orgs. That in and of itself is sort of a unique product offering because there's not a lot of, not a lot of technology that's specifically designed to address that scenario. Um, so yeah, as we learn, we'll start to make it a little more automated. So I'm, and I'm the technical voice in all that. So yeah, I, what happens is I'm in these conversations with a bunch of like, you know, PhDs or like, you know, managers of nonprofits and I'm trying to kind of use my humanistic talent, which is to listen to what their problem is and then be able to go back into the office and say, I know, I know what their problem is. I don't know how to fix it, but I'll figure it out. And then I can get to work tinkering and, you know, coming up with solutions and present them to them. Do you think, do you miss not? Being a, how do you how do you encounter not being a coder in your day to day as CTO? Uh, are you aware of it at all, or is it not even something you're aware of because we have the type forms and the Zapiers and the Google Sheets and stuff? I mean, honestly, it's coming to a point where you can do so many powerful things with such little effort that, um, you know, and I'm not just finding that with myself either. I'm finding that with other companies. Um, that I'm seeing now in the marketplace, just friends of mine who are building things or people who come for investing, they're building things on their own without much technical expertise in their background. Background. Um, it's called like I think it's called like the complexity par paradox or something like that. As 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 tools are are made to solve more complex problems, the tools themselves become less complex. So like imagine how simple Google is to use as a search engine, it's just a single form. But the complexity underneath is massive, right? And so it's just that 
that paradox. The harder the problem you're trying to solve, chances are the easier the actual experience can be with that. Mm. And so now we're thinking, you know, we have things like artificial intelligence and great things like Zapier. I mean, Zapier is a total game changer for, for building something. Um, uh, so, you know, non-technical people, I think, have very powerful tools that they're... So it sounds possible. like you're not, you're, you're not really, you don't have that moment in the day where you say, oh, I wish I could have just coded this myself. Um, not, not that a CTO needs, needs that. I'm just saying, since you don't have that coding base, uh, that junior software engineer, senior VP, you know, oh, director, yeah. whatever. Yeah, yeah, no. No, no, because I've got relationships. No. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm 42 years old and I still play soccer and I'm not the fastest guy out there, but I play pretty smart, I think. You know, I still score goals and there's 22-year-old kids out there running around. If one of your friends hurts their ankle really bad, <laughs> get up. <laughs> <laughs> no tolerance for weakness. Holy moly's, man. Yeah, I mean, I... I that's why I'm saying I'm I'm a little averse to calling myself a non-technical CTO. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get I get how things work. And I didn't start in this business as a you know as a paper pusher. I coded. You know, I was building things 20 years ago. Um but you know, I was only one page ahead in the manual as everybody else. And now there's so many good, you know, utilities out there that you don't have to you know, build stuff from scratch anymore. Um, so the challenge is just really figuring out how to piece together uh, these various building blocks that are available. Yeah, I love, uh, <clears throat> I love, I love it when a CTO has a very strong product bend, and I think most CTOs care passionately about the company they've joined, and then by implication, the products they build. And so I find them to be mostly opinionated about what the products need to be but not always um gifted in that space of mm. what the user or what the cost you know also fighting for the voice of customer and so where i can see the advantage that you have in this in the cto role is that you come with that very strong voice of customer bend yeah and then obsessing then over what the product needs to do in order to satisfy that yeah i mean i try it my superpower in that respect is just sort of, you know, decoding the culture of that user, decoding their, their thought processes and, you know, their anxieties and really trying to get in their headspace. So, so how do you plan on uh, building your team? So um, the model generally, the CTO, vision, future, um, skating to where the puck is going, um, appear in the C-suite, which obviously you're all those things. Um, and then the VP engineering type, which is then the day-to-day -day quality, standards, sprint management, execution. Mm. Is that, are you sort of just going to go that way or have, what have you done or what are you going to do? Um, well, right now we're small and scrappy and really trying to conserve, trying to approach the market in a, in a sustainable way. Um, we do have a little bit of funding, but in some respects, we're, we're trying to prove that there's a market for what we do. Um, and we can point to a bunch of market research that indicates there would be, but there's no real incumbent for the type of thing that we want to do. So it's hard to kind of point at you know, taxis and say, we want to subvert this business. Um, you know, there are no taxis in our line of work. It's all consultants who are taking large data sets and basically they're data scientists and they're just doing these one-off projects to figure out whether there was some impact or not. Um, so, so that being said, uh, I actually am probably the rare CTO who's saying, I don't need anybody else right now. Um, I think that's kind of a perpetual concern for CTOs is they could always use one, you know, more seats and chairs or more butts and chairs because they have, you know, ever increasing, you know, uh, debt equity and, and product needs to, to, to build for. And so, um, for us, I think by necessarily having those constraints, it's forced me 
and the one you know senior developer that I've hired for us to get really creative about what we're building and get really focused about how we're piecing together solutions for our customers. So when I say, you know, we're building forms that are like type forms, it's like, well, we found, you know, really good and very mature libraries for building forms that happen to snap into, you know, the node frameworks that we've already built. Um, so, you know, Gil can handle that work. I can help him research it. I can come up with the user specs. I can identify whether or not this is actually an appropriate path for us or whether we should build from scratch. And our customers' needs are thankfully not that sophisticated. You know, what, what we're able to do for them, even with our limited resources, is so much more than they're already accustomed to using that they're happy. Um, they're, they're happy with these solutions that maybe, mm. you know, aren't as finely wrought as what a big product team would be able to produce. And so do you see the growth of Tablecloth then as it scales? It's just um, uh, sort of more real-time integration and ingestion of data? Or do you see um, like a bring-your-own data model where people can just visualize that? Do you see some sort of, yeah, well, dare I say, social network around that? I well, mean, yeah, I mean, I think the, the big promise for us is that we're putting all these different entities in the same system. It's weird that you pick up on the social network piece as, as strongly as you do. We didn't. We still pitch the company as sort of analytics for nonprofits, or some variant of that. But really, what it is is it's it's getting all the interested parties together on the same page, or as our brand is sort of being built around the tablecloth, like come to the same table, build a bigger table, and get the needed work done, right? And so that's where it's been really interesting to develop that kind of, that just meeting place, that social network part of it, that the basis for the platform. The data can come from, you know, these real-time logs, right? Things that, you know, if a volunteer checks in, boom, there's a data point. Or it can come from, you know, a photograph or just a status update from the CEO or, an anecdote from a client who says, thank you for being in my life, you know, stuff like that, that those are data points. They hit more to the heart than they do to the mm. brain, but they're important for the work that's being done because there's, you know, there's no, there's no concept of a KPI in the nonprofit world and measuring by dollars just doesn't work. You have to measure by these other, other variables. And they're so many times qualitative versus quantitative. Do you think that, um, do you think that this could so I, I I love that 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 you are instinctively tugging at the hearts of all the players. I think that's that's brilliant. I, mm -hmm. I didn't even think about that. When we discussed tablecloth, I saw it as a raw analytics company, mm -hmm. but definitely having that component, if you can capture the hearts and minds of the players, then you can sort of build in sustainability. Do you think that there is a potential uh, a f negative effect where nonprofits are going to be are afraid to maybe see their own data. Uh, yeah, and we we don't uh, we don't require them to share beyond their their comfort zone. So as a rule, tablecloth is a closed network. Um, you couldn't just come to tablecloth and find a find a nonprofit you wanted to follow. Mm. That doesn't happen. You have to be invited into that circle in order to see what's happening. Um, and then even once you do, your role in that nonprofit determines what information you're seeing. So if I'm a volunteer, I may not be seeing you know, all the stuff that's intended for the staff to see, um, but I am seeing what's intended for the, for the volunteers to see. Um, I hope that makes sense. But the, the point being that it, there is a lot of insecurity in the nonprofit world where everybody wants to keep their silos because that's where their funding is dependent upon, right? They can say to a funder, I want this $20,000 grant because I'm the only person who can, I'm the only org that can solve this particular piece of the po problem. And, uh, and they're very reluctant to work with other orgs because they're, they're competing for those same dollars. That's mm -hmm. what they think anyway. And that's kind of the precedent that's been set up. Uh, we're hoping to change that. And we're really hoping to get them to understand that it's not a zero-sum game. 
you're getting this $20,000 grant doesn't prevent somebody else from also doing good work. It grows, it grows the ability to, to actually fix this problem. And you know, if you can prove that you have success, you'll only benefit from it, even if you share it, especially if you share it. So we have a I tough road it. to hoe there, but, I love it. but it's sponsored by the, the funders, which is really the power for how our business model works, is that we're not necessarily asking the nonprofits to buy into it. We're asking the funders, funders. to buy into it, and then they uh, get their fundees in line. Yeah, I, I'm almost seeing. Uh, I'm almost seeing like a, um, a Twitter that was able to provide a place for people to tweet. Then had all these people building in their a their Twitter client APIs and whatever spin they had on the client, mm. and Twitter didn't really care about that. It was seen as a good thing. And then late in the game, Twitter decided, well, now we will build our client. And uh, while it was, you know, everyone, all the Twitter clients obviously complained about it, but there's still clients that thrive that are not Twitter, uh, owned by Twitter. Mm -hmm. And so it's almost like tablecloth. I see the same where right now provide that data stream platform. Don't care too much about the data sources and how this comes in, as yeah. long as you're providing that one unified stream. Yeah. And then as you grow, you can start providing the, the further downstream, you can start providing the Internet of Things or the different tools or integrate with different tools yeah. that makes the reporting of that data more and more accurate. Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, we have real examples of that in, in, in the wild right now. We, well, so we built the product. I don't know if this was, this was intentional or ever stated, but we kind of, my developer and I just have a symbiotic relationship. We built it as an API first. And for a while, for a product guy like me, that's very frustrating, as you can imagine. Because there's, you know, only way I can access this thing is through curl. I mean, it's like pain in the ass, right? I want pretty buttons. Um, so we built it as an API first. Love it. And then on top of that, you know, built the first web client. And then, ironically, we deployed our first product as a type form form to a small nonprofit here in San Diego, which then built their own kiosk for checking in their clients. And then on top of that, created a QR code so that it was an easy check-in process and just, you know, they could zap the QR code and then answer one question and they were done. They built that. They built that whole process. So you took it up to the type form. Took it up to the type. Well, even the, up to the type form, that's not us, right? Type form is okay. taking over from so, that. So, so now they, they can... They can mess with the type form. So what you they provided was, so code. they just posted the type form to your API yeah. with a webhook or something. Yes. And Delicious. so so that's how, you know, I actually just met with them last week and looked at the innovations they've already built on top of this thing. And that, you know, they're, I picked them for a reason. They're young, they're creative, they're really hustling, they're doing good work. Um, and I figured if anybody would be able to kind of like take what we've done and run with it, it would be them. And then to see what they've actually been able to do with it has been, you know, pretty uh, eye opening. I mean, they, they were able to, to accomplish do that. Do you think they were inspired? Be like, what did you provide them that inspired them to do? Was it because they felt like, well, when we capture the data, it's going to go, at least it's going to go to something that looks usable? Um, I don't know. I think, I think they just, you know, it's one of these sort of problems that kind of gets put on the shelf. The, sh the problem is that they know they need to capture some data because every funder requires them to give them some metrics. And the way that they capture that data is often analog, right? So they'll write it on check-in sheets and then go and then double enter it into a spreadsheet later on and then look at it once a year when they need to do an annual report or get a big funding grant or something like that, right? And what I was able to demonstrate to them was, actually, what happens when we do this in real time? What happens when on Monday morning, instead of you typing in what other people wrote throughout the weekend, instead you're just looking at the data and you're saying, oh, well, shit, you know, I didn't know this was happening on Saturday. I'm going to go check in now with those mm. people and see what's going on, right? And so they immediately switch from, from this, you know, headache 
to proactively improving their business in real time. So that for them was the light bulb. And everybody in the org can, can align around this goal too, right? So everybody, whether you're, whatever role you have in that org, you can see this data come in and, and know how you're affecting, you know, what in their terms is. So this. just a, just a time, no brainer time saver. No, it's not a time saver. It's, it's how do we improve service? You know, it's, it's not, it, it is a time saver and it does, it does solve that problem for them. And that's the pill that we've given them to cure their headache. But once they don't have the headache anymore, they become creative thinkers and they become mm. proactively involved in their business, which is to make yeah. the world better. Yeah. So yeah, it's a compounding effect. So time's up. Mm. What I want to know is your, just give us just two or three or four or five <laughs> nonprofits that, that excite you and you don't have to go into it too much. We'll link to it in the show notes. Sure. But just broaden, broaden my horizon a bit with sort of what non, the nonprofits that are doing some. All right. Well, I'll give you two examples. Um, one is, uh, it's called Defy Ventures. Defy Ventures. Um, it's a nonprofit that helps uh, prisoners develop business plans and, in essence, uh, become pro productive citizens as soon as they get out of, out of prison. Um, the problem with going to prison is that you serve your time and afterwards you're branded with the stigma of being a felon. And even though your requirements for being on parole might be to have a job, uh, you're not going to get a job because you're a felon, an ex-felon. And so this program has been enormously successful in that you can kind of bypass the fact that, well, I don't need a job. I'll just start my business. Uh, and I'll go door to door selling whatever product or service that I've I've uh, you know been trained training to do since uh, since I got involved with this program. So Defy is amazing. There's lots of opportunities to volunteer and to kind of get emotionally connected to it. Um, it operates in California, New York, Connecticut, um, Colorado, just to name a few states. Um, so there's probably chances for you to get involved locally if you're listening to this and you're in a tech sector. They're probably there. Um, the other nonprofit that I'm excited about and working with here in San Diego is a company called 211, which provides a 911 type service for, uh, for just social services. You call 211 and they'll tell you if you have any kind of a, if there's any kind of a public service or social service that's, that's, uh, you know, uh, available to you. And so if you're homeless, you can call 211. If you're, uh, like know, the numbers two one one two one one just two one in my telephone here in San Diego yes in only in, in San Diego well it operates all over the nation but not all not all um it's not everywhere it's not ubiquitous <clears throat> it's not like nine one one yet anyway two one one because of the position they occupy as a refer to a lot of different social services has taken on what's called a community information exchange responsibility which is say I refer somebody as two one one I refer them to uh, get a bed at a homeless shelter. Um, now I can also refer them to that, that shelter that can also refer them to, to a place to get job training. And that job training can refer them to a place where they can get childcare. All that ref referral stuff happens outside of 211, but they can all share information together. So that's where the community information exchange is coming to play. The one here in San Diego is by far the best in the nation. Um, and the data platform that they've built is incredible. Um, and they've got mm. some good funders and really good um, local funders behind it. Yeah, yeah. It's it was a project that started. Uh, it was called Project Twenty Five, I think, USD project that um, tried to basically figure out what would happen if we provided coordinated care for the twenty five most expensive uh, people in San Diego, people who needed the most service in San Diego. And then from that, uh, we grew it to a thousand people an hour. To tens of thousands. Wow. Of yeah. Kelly Abbott. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Should we end as we started? Inappropriately? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for being with us, Kelly. You were awesome. Non technical CTOs rule. No? Non coder CTO tech CTOs. Non coder CTOs rule. Thank you. Cheers, brother. Yes. 
Have you chatted with the CTO lately? Hi, thank you for listening to the CTO Studio. If you don't mind, take a quick second and please rate and review the show. It helps us a lot. Go to thectostudio.com for more information on what we're doing at 7 CTOs. We also have a video or two for you that could be a helpful resource for you as you're managing your company. So thank you for listening.